I wanted to welcome everybody to the DOD EDIS Early Intervention Series webinar, our kickoff session. My name is Jane Dooley, and I am the technical host for today. And just to let folks know that we are recording today's session, and in an attempt to make the, uh, the, the recording as accessible as possible for both live and archived events, for both the hearing and the visually impaired, we're going to be making a conscious effort to verbally review much of the content that you see on the slides today. So information will be forthcoming about how you can access the recorded version of today, um, where that will be posted. And so I need to read this quick disclaimer with you all. Just so folks know, the appearance of hyperlinks does not constitute endorsement by the Department of Defense of this website or the information, products, or services contained therein. For other than authorized activities, such as military exchanges and morale, welfare, and recreation sites, the Department of Defense does not exercise any editorial control over the information you may find at these locations. Such links are provided consistent with the stated purpose of this DOD-sponsored webinar. So at this time, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Valerie O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien? Yes, um, Jane, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Good. Um, I just wanted to be sure that um, you know that we have um, Audrey Artisan and Major Kelly Seisberger and Lieutenant Commander Noah Sperner also on our um, participant list, and of course they're going to be presenting a little bit. Correct. And if you want to give me, uh, it was Audrey Artisan and, and I'll put them up into the right um, there. Uh, Major Kelly Seisberger. Okay. And, and it's Commander Noah, Noah Sperner. Very good. And Seisberger. Okay. Thank you. And, and I apologize, you guys, I have to approve every single person as they come individually, so it um, takes a little moment for me to, to keep accepting folks as they join. Very okay. good. So, Dr. O'Brien, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Okay. Well, I guess what uh, I'd like to welcome all, you all to this first webinar focused on DOD Early Intervention Services. And it's a good morning and good afternoon, and it looks like maybe a good evening to some, to some folks as we're all over the globe. As um, Jane mentioned, I'm Dr. Valerie O'Brien. I'm a program analyst at the Office of Special Needs. Unfortunately, Dr. Tyner, his, his name is on the opening slide, is not able to be here. He's our acting director at the moment, and he's being pulled in so many different directions that he's unable to attend today. My office, um, some of you may know, my office was established in 2010 as a result of the NDAA 2010 as um, a law, the National Defense Authorization Act, to provide oversight of the Exceptional Family Member Program as well as early intervention services provided by the military medical department. And special education, of course, and related services provided by DOTIA. Um, and our office was mandated um, to provide that oversight and support programs. And we also identify gaps in services for military families with special needs. And, um, as I mentioned, I'd like to welcome certainly our um, Audrey Artisan from Army MedCom, Major Kelly Seisberger from the Air Force uh, Medical Activity, Lieutenant Colonel and uh, Lieutenant Commander, sorry, Noah Sperner from um, Bureau of Medicine for the Navy, and of course Dr. Naomi Young from Army MedCom. And as I see, as everyone sees, there's a smattering of folks from all the services, so that's good. Um, it looks like mostly well, yeah, Army, Army, and Air Force are pretty. Uh, uh, 40, 40, 50 percent. So that's good to see. We have representatives from everyone. Thanks for attending. Okay. What we're going to do is highlight the big picture of this series. The first thing we're going to do is step back and remember the big picture in early intervention services. Secondly, we're going to describe how we got to this shared training, and that's talking about the DOD collaboration and standardizing our processes and documents. And then we're going to discuss the combined services webinar training plan. And of course, we have to be reminded this is change, and change is inevitable, as we all know, second offending machines. And this, we are so familiar with a change across, I think, probably any organization. And um, um, this, is, this is going to continue, as we know. Okay, let's take a little step back and look at IDA, the Department of Defense. I'm just going to give you a brief snippet of our EDIS history. Um, some of you have been around a lot longer than I have and know the history, but um, I, want you to, I, I want to help us remember how much we've changed over the years. As you may know, EDIS services are provided, uh, sorry, as you all know, EDIS services are provided by the military medical department. We're all part of the, uh, one of the uh, medical commands of services. The clinics, the EDIS clinics are the 
EFMS clinics were first opened in the early 80s, and they were known as the EFM services or the Exceptional Family Member Services or the EFM departments, Exceptional Family Member Departments, and they provided related services to Oconus dogs. In 1991, DOD was directed to provide comparable early, intercept, early intervention services as described in IDEA. And this was mandated by Public Law 102-119. The military medical departments instituted early in intervention services in the early 90s, as we know. And the name was changed to EDIS in 1998. And as we begin this training, we've all collaborated and adopted the uniform logo, which you'll see us use on all the slides. Okay, another poll. This could be a tough one. What is the current IDEA statute? Okay, it looks like the majority of folks are getting there. Take a go. Okay, Jane, what do you think? Okay, I just went ahead and closed that. It looks like a good 90% of folks are saying uh, number C, or number letter C. <laughs> That's right. It looks like most folks have said C, and that, of course, is correct. Public Law 108-446. We're just going to take a quick look of how we got there. Um, and to reinforce to everyone that EDIS is based on educational legislation, IDEA. And EDIS, our EDIS programs essentially implement IDEA in the DOD. In, 19, in 1975, as some of us may remember, um, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act was passed, and this is the beginning of a law of its own which mandated access to full educational opportunities for all children with disabilities. In 1986, in the public law, and amendments were added to that law, where Part H, focusing on infants and toddlers, was included, and the age of eligibility for special education and related services was lowered to age three. And this law established the Handicapped Infants and Toddlers Program, which was the beginning of early intervention services. In 1990, the law was renamed from EHA to IDEA with the emphasis on people first language, not handicapped children, but individuals with disabilities, which we can, that type of language, of course, continues today. In 1997, Part H was renamed Part C and provided additional guidance on early intervention services in introducing use of natural environments. And of course, 2004 in our amendments today. This is um, builds on the legacy of IDEA and, and further reinforces and refines, refines the law. And this is just some demographics for you. As you can see, it's a growing system. Early intervention services is a growing system of Supports and services provided in every state and territory. Individual states and territories, it, it, the data is available if you go to that website, and you can see it from uh, 1994 to 2011. Um, the percentage of children and families participating, of course, varies as well across the states, from 1.6% in states like Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma, and South Dakota, to 6.7% of um, eligible children in uh, Massachusetts. And as we, as we know, as you review your data and go back over the years in our AEDIS programs, our data is somewhat consistent with the state data. Um, shows an increase in the numbers um, participating in our services. Um, and we average anywhere between 2 and 6 percent of eligible children. Of course, as we know, the programs and the numbers have shifted um, as installations closed and units are reassigned, reassigned. So it is difficult, really, to kind of look at an increase in number of services within um, Confidence. I just want to give you a, a little bit of history of how we've got to this services collaboration. Um, there, as, as many of you are aware, have been around a while. There have been opportunities and and um, sharing of information and and um, training on many levels on varied occasions across the services between program managers, early intervention program managers, and providers. Um, but this past few years have provided us an opportunity for more formalized collaboration. As um, across the DOD, they've been, uh, programs have been encouraged to become more efficient, 
um, share and standardize services and as the medical department moved toward combining their health services. It became evident that it was, that it was important for us to participate in that process too and it provided us an opportunity to work together and um, develop, our, develop or, or engage in our um, shared standardized processes. And as many of you know, there have been some discussions of, of um, transferring the program, uh, um, EDIS programs to DODIA. That still is in the discussion phase. Um, it's on the table still, um, but as you know, as you are well aware, we've been talking about that for many years, and I expect it will be a few more years before that actually happens as well. So as we begin these, we're talking about um, implementing joint processes and documents, a service, and our services um, will be consistent for military families within the DOD. This, this emphasis on our standardized program will really um, help us to um, present, to allow everyone from providers to families to know what our services are. And these are our collaborators. There's been, um, of course, myself from the Office of Special Needs and um, Dr. Tyner and um, Laurie Sebastian. And of course, Audrey and Naomi from the Army Medical Command, Audrey Otterson, Dr. Naomi Youngren from the Army Medical Command, Major Seisberger from the Air Force Medical Activity, and um, Lieutenant Commander Noah Sperner from Navy Bureau of Medicine. And of course, Dr. Frank Carden was involved in a lot of the collaboration prior to this um, coordinated effort and training. Um, if you could each, I'd like um, each of the service representatives to um, just, you know, Say a few words about um, efforts within the services. So if you wouldn't mind, um, Major Seisberger. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Oh, great. It worked. All right. So this is Major Seisberger. Um, I oversee for the Air Force both EFMP and EDIS. And so we are so excited to be working with the other services and with the Office of Special Needs to collaborate and go towards the best practices and the standardized um, you know, model and standardized forms. And so this has been very exciting for us as we work with our partners and, and helping our families and the children at our um, predominantly Oconus location. So thank you so much for having us be a part of this. Thanks, Kent. Thanks, Major Seisberger. Um, Audrey Sartson? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. yes. Hi. Hi. Oh, I'm really, really glad I was able to connect on, on this system. It's uh, quite impressive, actually. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very, very pleased that we're all wanting to sing off the same sheet of music on this. Uh, and it's been, it's been a, a long but really worthwhile effort to come to agreements on, on how we want to, to train and, and how we want to serve our families. Uh, they go from place to place, from service to service, and we serve each other's uh, families, and it's important that they expect the same thing no matter where they go. Um, I just wish we had EDIS programs at every single military installation in the world, but we're not that lucky. Um, I'm, I, there, an awful lot of work has gone into this over the past year. Um, at the DOD level, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, everyone who participates can appreciate the amount of work that has gone into this. Um, it's important that we become standardized uh, as we become a single medical entity as the Defense Health uh, Program uh, becomes a single purple-suited entity. So... Uh, we're not going to be caught trying to catch up. Any of us are going to not, you know, it's all going to be the same. So anyway, uh, you know how passionate I've been, I think all of you do, about early intervention and uh, getting it done uh, right for families. So um, enjoy these webinars. Hopefully you will all participate in all of them. I know that many of our Army folks are going to be hearing things that they've already heard in many, much of our training, but please stay with us and uh, 
uh, you may find that there are a few things that have changed. I know that some of our forms and our policies have changed uh, in order to um, be uh, to concur with what we have all agreed on on the standardization. So, um, you know, have a have a good training, and uh, I'll be listening in on all of the other uh, webinars as they come along. Thank you. Over. Thanks very much, Audrey. And Lieutenant Commander Sperner. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Lieutenant Commander Noah Sperner. I just wanted to say um, thanks for uh, everyone for attending. And I know a lot of um, behind-the-scenes things, planning. Um, so special thanks for uh, Dr. Naomi Younger in Germany and also for uh, Dr. Uh, Valerie O'Brien for uh, off special needs. And um, I know a lot of it is just working with everyone to uh, make sure that um, the various forms and things are uh, standardized and consistent across all the services that everybody uh, receives um, care for the programs, no matter where they're at, and it, uh, that they obtain the things that they need. And I know one of the other things uh, just wanted to mention is, like, as you probably are aware, there's a couple of things for uh, done at the service headquarter level. One of the things recently that we're working on is uh, the DD Form 2792 and 2792 TAC-1 relicensing and uh, taking the feedback from the, uh, the field and working with the Office of Special Needs to uh, revise those forms. And um, if anybody has any questions or, or uh, with, uh, needs any additional information or things like that from uh, Bureau of Naval Medicine, uh, certainly uh, feel free to uh, get in touch with me. Probably a lot of folks uh, probably remember uh, Dr. Frank Carden, and uh, um, he retired at the end of July, and about a month after that, I kind of assumed the role here for uh, BUMED. So um, my, my name might not be as familiar with everybody, but I am working in the capacity of the same thing that uh, Dr. Frank Carden uh, worked on, so he did DSMP and uh, suitability screenings for, uh, for the Navy. Thank you. And thanks very much, Lieutenant Commander Sparner. It has um, been great that you've been able to kind of continue to support the, uh, the Navy shift as well. Well, it's nice to, as, as, as they alluded to, we've been um, busy over the past couple of years anyway um, in trying to bring all this together. Um, and, of course, when we throw in the furloughs and all the other delays, it um, have really has been, as we all know, a bit of a trial. So... We'll continue to talk a little bit more about standardization. And of course, this is to align all our early intervention services, um, including the forms, using uniform forms and processes, sharing our training, and of course, collecting and using the data for program improvement. And this certainly, as I mentioned, will benefit not only military families, but managers, providers, the DEA, and the command at all. Okay, well, we're just uh, going to spend the last bit of time talking just to, um, to bring us all together, reminding ourselves about the key principles of early intervention. Um, these principles certainly don't apply only to EDIS, but our principles and practices developed at the national level that are meant to guide our EI implementation across the United States. And our, um, our early intervention expert and nationally recognized educator, Dr. Naomi Youngren, is going to be our guide as we begin to talk about this review. Many of you know um, Dr. Youngren. Um, she's the Comprehensive System of Personnel Development Director for the Army MedCom. And in that role, she facilitates um, early intervention processes and practices to ensure that um, medical command is compliant with IDA Part C implementation and R1340-12. And many of you may not realize, but we are very, very fortunate to have such a renowned educator in our own system. Dr. Youngwood is nationally recognized. She's a nationally recognized leader in early intervention and has over 30 years' experience in early childhood special education, including direct service provision, in early intervention and preschool programs. She has special expertise in authentic assessment, natural environments and inclusion, family-centered practice, and outcomes. And we are so pleased that she'll be your trainer for the webinar series. And I'd like now to turn the webinar over to her. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Young. Wow, thanks. <laughs> um, I, as we've 
as I've had the opportunity to listen to other folks along the way here, um, I've noticed that we've had a little bit of difficulty with the audio portion. So I'm going to speak up. Um, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm yelling, but if there is any difficulty with hearing me, please put a chat in the chat box. I've got an eye on that as well to make sure that um, I can try to adjust my volume so that everybody can hear as, as we move along here. So I think as you heard from our, um, from our sister services, um, that really a focus here is moving towards standardization, um, having common practices across the Army, the Air Force, um, and the Navy. Um, I really want to reinforce that this is um, very much a tri-service effort, um, and I'm very pleased to see that we've got a great turnout. Um, there's 83 folks on the webinar today. And I know, in fact, that there are more than that because some of you have coupled up. So um, I think this is an awesome turnout for our first kickoff for really working towards a tri-service initiative of best practices for children, for families, um, across our programs, and certainly for all stakeholders um, involved with early intervention um, and support and services to children and families. I do want to start off um, reviewing the key principles and practices. Uh, I'm going to scoot back just a slide here. Um, these are the agreed upon mission and key principles and practices for providing early intervention services in natural environments. Most of you have probably seen this information before, um, but just in case, please know that the website there where you can access these documents is listed here on the screen. Um, you can also do it the way I do it and go to Google and punch in early intervention key principles and practices and it will bring you to the website. Let me tell you just a little bit about these key principles and practices and why we look to these um, as really um, guiding um, principles for our program. It was the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center, now called ECTA, formerly it was called NECTAC, um, and the Office of Special Education Programs that sponsored this group of national experts in early intervention to develop these guiding principles for providing effective services for young children with developmental delays and disabilities. The national work group that developed these documents included parents, researchers, Part C coordinators, program developers, representatives from professional organizations, um, early intervention, and technical assistance providers. So it was really a very diverse group um, that made up the, um, this national work group. And their work included the production of several called consensus documents, because this was the consensus thinking across the various different um, researchers and leaders in the field of early intervention that got together and agreed upon these seven key principles that we're going to spend just a bit of time today taking a look at. This original group um, community of practice, we called it, um, was originally charged by OSEP to take a look at the provision of services in natural environments. However, what happened was the field had made such great progress with the provision of services in natural environments, and when I say that, I mean um, providing services in locations where children without disabilities typically spend time, e.g., e home and um, community locations. But what this group found was what was really needed was more of an emphasis on how services are provided versus just where services are provided. Um, so that was a major charge for this particular group. I'm going to scoot ahead to the next slide here. And here what you have are the seven key principles. These are the seven key principles that the group came up with. In addition to the document about the seven key principles, there's information about what these principles look like, what they don't look like, um, that I think are critically important as we continue to move forward as a standardized tri-service effort. We will look to these key principles to guide us along the way as we develop um, and refine our, our, our practices. What I'd like to do now is in the theme of standardization is let's just take a look at agreement with the seven key principles and practices. You'll see the poll that's set up there on the left of your screen. I also want to reinforce to you that there is no way to link the poll responses back to any one individual. So please 
have your responses be truly what you believe here and now today with regards to each one of these seven key principles that we're going to go through. I'm going to give you a minute to respond to that, to this first principle, and that is infants and toddlers learn best through everyday experiences and interactions with familiar people in familiar contexts. Okay, I think, uh, well, I've got a couple more folks coming in there. Um, as you can well see from the poll on the side, the vast majority of us truly believe that, or strongly agree with this particular, with this particular principle. Um, I want to reinforce that there is, in fact, a strong line of research supporting this principle, as well as the other principles. Uh, for a child, um, family, and community perspective, we know that children are naturally curious and learn from everything that they do throughout their day, and that families are the natural facilitators of their children's participation in daily routines and activities. We also know that communities provide opportunities for activities that can promote children's learning. And these are all bits that we are going to tap into um, in our provision of early intervention services to, uh, to support families. In practice, part of what this principle means is that early intervention providers help families and certainly other caregivers engage the child in enjoyable activities that allow for frequent practice of current and emerging skills. And it really is this frequent practice that's so incredibly powerful to children's learning. I'm reminded of some research that was conducted by Karen Adolf, um, and she was looking at early walkers and discovered that beginning walkers, walkers practice walking up to, and get this, the length of 29 football fields in a day as they reach walking proficiency. Um, I don't know about you all, but it's been a while since I've walked 29 football fields in a day. Um, if any of you have had the opportunity to follow a toddler around, you can probably appreciate that they, in fact, may walk just that far. So I don't want to dwell on each one of these principles, um, but I do want to reinforce and take a look at um, our consensus agreement across these, because this will help to guide our work forward. At this point, um, are there any um, additional comments with regards to this particular principle that anybody wants to make? OK, I checked the chat box, too, so please feel comfortable to use that. Um, we, can address, we can use that along the way as well. So moving on, I want to take now a look at our second key principle, and this is that all families with the necessary supports and resources can enhance their children's learning and development. So let's take a look. Please use the poll off there to the left to respond to this key principle as well using the five-point scale. OK, I still see some boats coming in. Okay, as you can tell from this poll, there's a little bit more variation across the responses. Um, certainly, again, the majority are at a strongly agree level. Um, I do want to reinforce, as the work group worked on this particular principle, um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the emphasis on all um, and did come to a consensus that all means all, with, of course, the caveat and the recognition that some families are going to need more or different types or degrees of supports and resources. Um, but I do want to highlight that the group did reinforce that all means all, that all families um, with the necessary supports and resources can, in fact, enhance their children's development. From a child, family, and community perspective, we know that children live in different types of families, that families have hopes and dreams and wishes for their children, and that communities offer resources that families can use, we also recognize, of course, that not all communities have equal resources, just the same as not all families have the same types and resources. So in practice, this principle means that early intervention providers need to suspend some personal judgments and build rapport and trust with families to truly understand the family and the resources they have in place in order to support their children 
and to work first from the resources that the family has in place. Okay, I don't see any additional um, any additional comments um, with regards to this principle before we move on. Okay, I'm going to move us along to uh, to the key principle number three, and this is the primary role of a service provider in early intervention is to work with and support family members and caregivers in children's lives. So please here again use the poll to respond to where you are at with regards to agreement with this particular principle. Okay, again, it looks like we've got the majority at the strongly agree. There are still, um, there are a few folks at the agree point, um, but we don't have anybody um, at the neutral disagree or strongly disagree point. Um, we're seeing a bit of a pattern here so far with the, the, with the first three key principles. Uh, this principle reinforces that intervention is about helping families help their children and not about providing just child-centered direct therapy. One key point I think to remember here is that we talk often about how intervention happens between visits. We certainly know that families are the constant in child's lives and in fact the primary source of lifelong support and very early learning. From a child, family, and community perspective, we know that children's functional learning does not happen in individualized sessions with just an EI provider directing the activity while the family sits on the sidelines. Families naturally offer children many opportunities to learn and practice skills, and community agencies should support, not supplant, families' natural activities. In early intervention practice, this means that early intervention providers provide feedback and encouragement as they see those naturally occurring incidental teaching moments that families use. So a focus here is supporting families to help families help their children to grow and to learn. As we move along through, as we move along through these uh, key principles, there is certainly a great degree of breadth and depth and supportive research behind them. And as we move on through, I'm going to share with you some additional resources that I think you might find helpful. So um, anything else on principle three? I hate to push us along too quickly, but anything else on principle three before I move on? OK. So principle number four. This is that early, the early intervention process from initial contact through transition must be dynamic and individualized to reflect the child's and family members' preferences, learning cultural beliefs. Let's take a look at the poll here and see how, um, where folks are at with agreement with this particular principle. Okay, I think with this one, this is the one that we are, um, the vast majority of us, um, nearly 100%, are at the strongly agree, um, degree of, the, of agreement with this particular principle. Um, I'm reminded, just think of the mix of families that you work with now, and you, of course, will be reminded about the diversity across, across families. Um, certainly from a child, family, and community perspective, we know that children develop rapidly within those first three years of life, and we know that families' needs and priorities change according to the life circumstances. What we also know from a community perspective is that community activities should optimally support and be relevant to the needs and interests of families. So we have to work with our community partners as well um, to ensure that um, we can work to fill those gaps in services. In practice, this principle means starting where the family is at and using the family's cultural beliefs and daily activities as sources of learning for the children. Over the years, we've seen a greater, greater emphasis on looking at principles of adult learning, and it's also understanding adult learning styles as we work with and support families to help families to help their children to grow and learn. Okay, let's move on to principle number five. 
This principle is that IFSP outcomes must be functional and based on children's and families' needs and family-identified priorities. Let's see where you're at with this one. I'm watching the poll still move, um, and it looks like we're we almost got everybody logged in there. And here again, we see the majority at the strongly agree point, um, with a smaller percentage moving down to agree and a, and a, a neutral person as well, and one strongly disagree. Okay, there has certainly been a significant amount of work and a great focus over the years on the importance of functional IFSP outcomes that are truly derived from families' priorities and not based on what providers think families should be doing um, or based solely on deficit areas that, that children um, have with regards to standardized testing and such. Um, I know you all have worked really hard to understand what families' priorities are and that's really where we want to be with regards to IFSP outcomes is we want to make sure that our IFSP outcomes are, in fact, the family's priorities. Granted, of course, you all have a great wealth of knowledge and expertise and experience um, with regards to understanding children's development, um, understanding disabilities, understanding children's delays, and it's going to be critical that you, as you do, share that information with families to help families make informed decisions about what their priorities are for their child as well as what their priorities are for their, for their children. In practice, what this means is that early intervention providers listen to families' needs and concerns about their children and write outcomes that are contextually relevant and meaningful to the family and that they're based on families' priorities. So, for example, you might have an outcome that sounds something like, Jeffrey will participate in mealtimes by using his spoon so that he's less messy. Or Marguerite will participate in bath time by sitting up in her bath seat so that she can play more easily. The focus here is making sure that the outcomes are contextually relevant, meaningful for families, and truly functional for children's success um, or families' desires. Any additional thoughts or questions with regards to this uh, key principle? And I know um, as the three services are coming together, there may in fact be some variations in the way that IFSP outcomes are written. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do some work along this um, to, to further standardize, recognizing of course that there is um, more than one way to write an IFSP outcome. Okay, I'm going to move on to our sixth principle. This is that the family's priorities, needs, and interests are addressed most appropriately by a primary provider who represents and receives team and community support. So where are you at with this one? Go ahead and use the, the poll again. Okay, I see... Um, we're, many folks are, are completing the poll. I think we're just about got everybody or nearly everybody. Um, this one I think what we see is a little bit more variation. We see um, a, a greater distribution between A and B, strongly agree and agree than we did on some of the prior ones. This particular principle does in fact reinforce a transdisciplinary approach. Um, this means of course that services are not fragmented across disciplinary lines but that the primary provider receives the needed support from other team members in order to support the child and the family. From a child, family, and community perspective, we know that children's complex needs can in fact be met by a primary provider when, and this is the emphasis here, when there's effective consultation and support from other professionals. In no manner, shape, or form does this principle or does the model of transdisciplinary approach imply that only one uh, professional can meet all the needs of a child and family. They need to have the expertise across the other team members um, in, order to, in order to do this. So it doesn't mean that there's a bunch of, um, that we're functioning as lone soldiers, but we're really making sure that there's an emphasis on 
collaboration and consultation and peer coaching um, in order to effectively support families. Families also can receive um, consistent and coordinated information from a primary provider who works in partnership with other team members. We also know that community agencies beyond early intervention can be part of the IFSP team. So in practice, this means that one consistent provider understands and keeps abreast of the changing circumstances, needs, interests, strengths, and demands in a family's life and works in partnership with other team members to effectively support the child and support the family. It means providing co-visits when needed by the primary provider and the family. This is a, an area that many stateside early intervention programs have been um, struggling to achieve as well. Uh, one of the nice things we have with our EDIS programs um, is that all of our programs are essentially under one roof and we're not having to um, always contract out for various different services, which makes it a little bit easier to have that high quality consultation. Any thoughts um, that anybody wants to add with regards to this particular principle? Okay, I'm going to move us along then um, to the next poll, to the next principle, which is also the, the last of the seven principles. This one is that interventions with young children and family members must be based on explicit principles, validated practices, best available research, and relevant laws and regulations. So please chime in using the poll um, with your agreement on this one. Okay. Um, here again, we've got the majority at a strongly agree, um, and then lesser percentages as we move our way um, across the across the scale. There, as you can well imagine, the challenge of trying to have a a good, rich discussion with 87 participants across across the globe is is a little bit of a challenge. But I would love to have more dialogue and discussion around each one of these seven key principles, um, and we will have some of that opportunity as we move along through the webinar series. Um, but if somebody has any particular questions, please don't hesitate to, um, to contact um, any one of the um, presenters today. So these particular key principles and practices, I'm reading, these, I'm reading one of the posts here. These should be best practices from all disciplines. And in yes, in fact, they do cut across all disciplines. Um, it's not just for one particular these are not key principles and practices just for early child special educators or just for OTs. These are, in fact, key principles and practices um, for all disciplines. And I'm going to share with you some additional information with regards to that as well. Um, in practice, what this particular principle means is that there is opportunities to clearly explain the rationale for suggesting particular intervention strategies. It means researching intervention strategies. It means drawing upon the wealth of knowledge that your team members, those folks that you sit next to on your team, that they have, um, and to be able to work together with them. And when I say the wealth of knowledge that team members have, this includes families as well. Um, I'm sure um, many of you have had the opportunity to learn wonderful strategies and resources from families that you've worked with as well. This principle also means keeping up with recommended practice in, in the field of early intervention and in the field that you practice and, and in other um, disciplinary area areas as well, such as OT, PT, and, and speech, so on. Um, it means sharing and discussing the information, and it means making and taking the time to reflect on your practices in light of agreed upon principles and practices in early intervention. So I remind you that these seven key principles um, are used as guiding principles as we work with and develop our early intervention tri-service program. There are a couple of resources here on the screen that I want to highlight to you. Um, one is uh, this one that's in pink. The date is 2012. This was put together primarily by 
um, the late Wendy Whipple, who unfortunately died unexpectedly, um, but she put together a great resource uh, that we can continue to use. What this is, is it is a look at the seven key principles that we just reviewed, and it cuts across or crosswalks across the various different um, professional organizations. So, for example, it takes the seven key principles and it looks at the literature from American Academy of Pediatrics. It looks at information from the, um, from the um, Division of Early Childhood Council for Exceptional Children, from ASHA, from AOTA, from APTA. So what you will see is that these seven key principles do, in fact, cut across all of the different disciplines. They're not specific to one particular discipline. This other resource that you have on the screen here is put together by ECTA. It was part of a work group um, in Washington as they were revising their IFSP processes. This particular resource um, available from ECTA is in fact an annotated bibliographic database containing a variety of different literature that supports the seven key principles. So you can go to this database. It runs similar to an EBSCO, if you're familiar with an EBSCO search engine. Um, and you can go in and find a variety of different um, research-based uh, journal articles representing a wide variety of literature, research reports, um, and service delivery approaches um, and, and opinion papers. Um, so it really is a rich resource. Both of these, um, I think, provide you with a bit more of the breadth and the depth and the application of these seven key principles in practices. So I strongly encourage you to take some time to look at these resources um, and certainly discuss them with your colleagues as well. So let's talk now briefly um, in our few minutes that we have left about the DOD IFST process. This is where you are at. You are at the introduction to the DOD Early Intervention um, Services. We have a series of six more webinars that we are going to be conducting. Each one of these webinars is going to be delivered two times during the week. Um, you all should have gotten the schedule um, a few different times um, with regards to when these are going to be. Um, that the seven different principles, uh, the, excuse me, the seven different webinars are, are listed here in addition to the first one that we're doing. Let me share with you a couple of other documents that you may have received already. One is an individualized family service plan. It, um, I believe the title might look a little bit different. Um, it's the process guidance. Uh, this particular document is what we're going to be referring to as we move through the webinars. You should have gotten a PDF version of this. I encourage you to use that one just because the pages um, will all have the same um, start and end. You'll also, if you haven't already received the IFSP, what we call the IFSP PD, um, the process document that cuts across from that very first contact with the family all the way through to full IFSP. And um, so I encourage you to read, take a look at these um, resources before our next webinar. If you have any questions or don't have these, um, please get in touch with uh, myself or one of the other presenters today. I will tell you as I, um, each one is going to be offered twice a week. Um, we have tried to coordinate these across the different time zones. We are going to be offering contact um, our certificates. These will be non-discipline specific um, continuing education documents. As we complete all of the webinars, you will receive a certificate of participation. The webinars are also going to be archived on the Military One source. However, I don't know how long that process is going to take. I understand it is a fairly cumbersome process. So we'll be getting more information on that from Military One source as that becomes available. The next slide that I want to highlight here is the one that um, has the corrected dates on it now. Um, this was sent out to some folks earlier as well. Just to reinforce to you the content that will be covered in each one of the following subsequent webinars and that each one of these subsequent webinars is linked to content that is included in that 
IFST um, handbook that you received. So at this point, with one minute till four o'clock, are there questions not only for me but for any of the other presenters um, or um, anybody else that is participating um, in our webinar today? I see one question about what if you're on leave during the scheduled webinars or if you're not able to participate. Um, we certainly recognize that that's going to happen. Um, Although we would like each and every one of you to, to participate, we recognize that life happens and sometimes that's not always possible, um, which is why we are going to have them archived. Um, depending upon participation, we might also look to offer um, one or two depending upon the need um, at additional time. Um, if, so the roundabout way to, um, to answer that question, also check with your colleagues. Um, have your colleagues sit in and share the information with you if you're not able to participate. Here's another one. How do we get copies of IFSP documents to review before the next webinar? Um, you should be receiving those um, from your, from your uh, point of contact. So um, those, will be, those will be going out shortly if you don't ha already have them. I believe Jane here is working on putting together a file share. So you should be able to access those. Jane, do you want to talk a little bit about how to access those from the file? Yeah, page? thank you. And I'm sorry for covering up your slide a little bit, um, no, running out of real estate. Um, I did just upload the PDF version of the slide deck. This version does contain the updated slide with the correct dates and in, uh, for the upcoming sessions. So if you did not happen to receive uh, an e in the email confirmation that was distributed with the meeting information, the dial-in information, I had attached a email. Um, I'm sorry. I had attached a PDF to that document uh, to that email um, that was distributed. I did as we got started here in meeting. I did send a blast out to that same list that contained just the revised slide number 30 as an attached PDF. So that should be in your email boxes. And for anybody that did not get either of those emails, or if you have uh, multiple people at your location and you'd like to download a copy of the file, you can do that here. Just click and highlight that file and where it says file share and you should um, receive a, the button should highlight where it says save to my computer. You might receive a couple of prompts um, from the Adobe software from DCO guiding you with how to go ahead and download a copy of that. If anyone is having difficulty downloading this uh, file here and, and did not receive that email, uh, if you want to send me your uh, name and email in the chat box, I'll be sure to get a copy of it out to you at the end of the session here. Okay, I want to be respectful of everybody's time as well. I don't um, hear any additional questions at this particular point. I do want to reinforce, so as we continue to move forward with the next series of webinars, um, that there will be more opportunity for dialogue and discussion via the chat or via um, the, the telephone line. Um, I recognize that all of you um, have been working in early intervention for a number of years and have a great wealth of knowledge and experience to share. Um, so I really do want to encourage you to do that, um, to raise questions, to um, offer um, ideas that you have because it's really the wealth of knowledge of all of us that really is going to make this tri-service program be the very best that it can be for children, for families, and for other stakeholders that we work with. Dr. Youngren, thank you so very much. Um, I just wanted to ask folks, um, we didn't actually create a slide to this effect, but we do want to kind of get your feedback if you found this webinar to be helpful or not. I did go ahead and open up the poll again. So in your mind's eye, if you can picture a question saying, <laughs> was this event helpful for you? Um, and if you could use, uh, thank you, Dr. Youngren, use that uh, grid between strongly agree, agree, neutral disagree and strongly disagree. And again, please know your name is not associated with the responses. Um, and that will just help give us um, some information about uh, today's event. Dr. O'Brien, I'm not sure if you had any other closing comments? Uh, no, I didn't. I think um, I'm very pleased that everyone was able to participate today as we get started in this training series. Um, and I, as we all have said, it's going to be fantastic <laughs> Over the next, it's going to take us a few years to all get there, um, 
but I know that it's going to be a, 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 a really great program um, as we all move towards our shared collaborative services. I also wanted to put our contacts up there. Um, you all should pretty much know how to get in touch with us all if you have additional questions, um, and certainly we are available. Thank you so much. As another matter of housekeeping, um, I will leave the website open for a bit, so if you do need to copy down any of this information or click on that file share, you can do so. Um, just to let folks know that we are going to continue to use the registration pages so that we can kind of get an idea, gauge uh, the level of interest for the different times and the different topics. Um, we will continue to use the registration page, but just so you know, the, the, um, the access to the room is going to continue to be this link and the, tele the teleconference number. We're going to see about if we can um, find some um, international dial-in numbers uh, for folks to use to join. But do know that going forward, and we will continue to send out email uh, confirmations with this information um, going forward, but do know that this is going to be the same room link and teleconference number that we'll be using throughout the series. So hopefully that makes it a little easier for folks to join. <laughs> no, that's great. But I, I'd like to make a last comment here. This is Audrey. Uh, I want to thank the Army uh, providers and personnel uh, for participating. Um, I think this is very important, although you may feel that you've heard a lot of this before, and, and you will as the, as the meeting goes along. But there's a secondary uh, advantage to participating in these webinars. You will get to know all of the EDIS providers from the other services. And I think that the, this is a very small community of providers. There are not a lot of, a lot of you out there. And it's valuable to get to know the providers of your same discipline and other disciplines that are also working in uh, DOD early intervention. And I encourage you to look at the attendee list and uh, do some collaborating and, and uh, consulting with one another as you go through this process as well as uh, in your day-to-day -day services. We won't be having a lot of money to be getting uh, training conferences together. So this is a very, very good way for you all to meet each other, get to know who you are and where you are, and some of the unique challenges that each of you have in delivering services. So uh, if you look up there in, in the, that top box, I think, you could probably see who all is participating. How is it possible, uh, by the way, uh, Jane, uh, how would it would it be possible to send out a list of participants and their email addresses uh, to all of the participants so that they can actually uh, get in touch with one another uh, at other times besides the webinars? Um, we do have so uh, yes, with folks' participation today, we would have that information. And what I'll do is take that back to um, Dr. O'Brien and my contact, and just um, find a way that maybe we can um, accommodate that for you. Because I think it's important that you uh, get in touch with your colleagues in in EDIS and and get that sense of community. You're all going to be working for the same boss here shortly, anyway. So. You may as well all develop that, that sense of community amongst uh, the EDIS program. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Yes, thanks. OK. Well, I thank you all for attending. And I hope you'll go ahead and register for the continuing series. Um, the schedule, I think, is correct now. So you'll be able to put that on your, on your schedules, your very busy schedules. And um, it's been a, a good start, I think. Um, as we begin the training series. And thanks, Dr. Youngren, as well. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and end the teleconference part of the event. I will leave the website open, as I just mentioned. Um, best of luck to all of you for the rest of your day today. Um, and if you do have any questions on the technical side, please feel free to send them over to, and I'll put that email address. You can send it to the MOS webinars at militaryonthers.com, which was the email address that um, uh, you received your materials from. So great. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jane.
Thank you. Bye-bye.